Hello and thank you for watching part 4 of this series where we are specifically focusing on what is known as the first resurrection and why there are such contrasting views on this subject. In the previous video we looked at how focusing on a single passage from God's word can lead to a totally different conclusion when compared to bringing into account more of what the Bible has to say about the matter. Today we will continue with our study in God's harvest of faith that remains after the first fruits were removed and how the Bible points out the differences between the two remaining sections of the harvest through good and evil servants. If this is the first video in the series that you have watched, please stop the video now and start with part 1, for which a link can be found in the description below. We will be discussing information in this video that will be built on the foundation that we have established up to this point, and if you do not watch the first three videos in sequence, it may be difficult to follow or understand the explanation given today. In the previous video we focused specifically on the ten virgins and how this group of ten is clearly representing the remaining sections of the harvest that represent the holy place and the outer court of the temple. In a number of the parables shared in the Gospels, Jesus described good and evil servants. One of these parables follows directly after the parable of the ten virgins, elaborating on the information already shared. Let us see what is said about the good and evil servants in the following passage. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one, went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents, behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents, behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed? Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The good servants in this parable have one common attribute that applies to both who were praised by their master, even though they have received different measures from their master. They doubled what they've received and have used that which they were given to increase that which belongs to the master. In contrast, the evil servant, even though he received from the master, did not do anything to increase that which belonged to his master. When the evil servant is evaluated, he begins by explaining how he perceived his master and gives us a bit of insight into the relationship that exists between him and his master. He explains that he knows his master to be a cruel person or a hard man, and a thief who would reap from fields that did not belong to him. It is very interesting that the evil servant points out his master's involvement with harvests, and through this we are shown that the master is the owner of crops to be harvested. This, in my opinion, once again shows us that the parable is connected to the resurrection of the dead. 
The evil servant's impression of his master's character is completely unfounded and certainly not supported by the word of God when we consider what is written. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he hath laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In light of these passages, we can see that our Heavenly Father paid the ultimate price to demonstrate his love towards us, and a greater love we will never be able to find. The fact that the evil servant had a false impression about his master's character points us to the fact that this person showed no interest in getting to know his master better, and as in the case of the foolish virgins, the master and servant did not know each other. The evil servant continues to accuse his master of being a thief, and has no insight either into the extent of his master's possessions. The word of God says the following, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Can our Heavenly Father be considered a thief if everything belongs to Him? The evil servant insulted his master by implying that he steals from others while all belongs to him, and condemns himself by the words that he utters in defense of his failure to use the talent provided to him. Once again we should remember that all the information regarding the evil servant is not provided in the parable of the talents alone and we find more elaborating information about the evil servant in the following passage. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Matthew 24, we are given a little more insight into the reasons for the lack of intimacy between the evil servant and his master. According to this passage, the evil servant has no desire for his master to return early because he is too focused on enjoying what the world has to offer. He has a preconceived belief that he keeps in his heart regarding the return of his master, and this would seem to be focused on allowing him more time to enjoy the pleasures of the world. Now this is also very important to keep in mind as the word of God gives us more insight into those who say in their heart or believe something in their heart instead of believing what God shows us in his word. This is very important. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. When we believe something in our heart that is not substantiated by the word of God, we are not only foolish, but we will also receive that which we believe in, or viewing this from another angle, we cannot receive that which we do not believe in. This is very important to understand in light of the remainder of the harvest. This aspect is also shown to be the main differentiating factor between good and evil servants. The evil servant has no expectancy or desire for the soon return of his master, while the good servant is continuously watching and expecting their master to return, and to be found ready when the master returns. The evil servant's desire is towards the world, while the good servant's desire is toward their master, and looking forward to what he had prepared for them while he was absent. The evil servant would seem to prefer to spend his time with unbelievers, living as an unbeliever, not using the talent that he received from his master or to shine his light before men so that he could gain souls for the kingdom and glorify God. This is what the word says about our master in relation to hiding talents in the ground. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord neither he that is sent, greater than he that sent him. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Evil servants are not shining their lights in the world, and would seem to be keeping their belief in Jesus as a get-out-of-jail ticket,
to be used in emergencies only, and in this way they are hiding the truth and the good news from those that they are interacting with in the world. They are not sharing the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus with those who are lost as instructed by their master. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Their focus in life is to enjoy the world and to remain in the world for as long as possible, in order to meet their own needs and to do that which they see as important. They have little to no concern for the bridegroom or their master's desires, neither are they concerned for those who are still in the clasps of the enemy and heading towards eternal separation from the master. Those who live their lives in this manner have received a serious warning, even though they are believers and are called servants of the Master. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. In light of what we have studied up to this point, it is really important to take note of what the Word of God is showing us. Many will argue that this passage cannot be referring to believers in Christ, and that all believers who have been saved will be removed from the world when the main harvest occurs. But can we really validate such a view against information, models and patterns that we have considered from the word of God thus far? We will look at this in more depth as we continue. The evil servant also explains that he acted out of fear when he hid his talent in the earth, or, as in the case of the ten virgins, was found to be without oil and unable to give light to the world. What was he afraid of when we look at what the Word of God says about believers who hide their talents? This fear that the evil servant claimed to have is linked to another passage that gives us insight into this servant's spiritual condition compared to those who have received God's indwelling spirit. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. In more than one way this points us to the evil servant lacking a spiritual life. The evil servant knows how the world would respond if it were to be revealed that he is a believer in Christ, and this is why they are afraid. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The evil servant is afraid of being hated by the world, because his desire is for the world, and not for his master. This servant is not concerned about those who will be lost because they have not declared God's faithfulness and salvation to them. He is only concerned about himself and does not want to lose his position in the eyes of the world, and for this reason he hides the truth in his heart and does not use the talent that God gave him to win souls for the kingdom. You will remember that one of the attributes of the gleanings or those who are beheaded for the word of God during the tribulation, as discussed during the previous video, is the presence of tears and weeping, and the mentioning of a gnashing of teeth in outer darkness, as we also see in the case of the evil servant. More information regarding this group is given to us in three other instances also mentioned in the book of Matthew, where Jesus tags them with the same reference of weeping and a gnashing of teeth as we saw in the first passage that addresses the evil servant. Here is another. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now some will say that this passage is a clear example of a reference to Israel, and I would agree with that point of view, but we also have to consider that we are dealing with a time period during which the final portion of God's faith harvest is addressed, and where Israel at the same time will be prepared under affliction for recognizing their Messiah, specifically coinciding with a point in time where the fullness of the Gentiles will be achieved. We have to remember that the period during which the weeping and gnashing of teeth occurs has more than one purpose, and some of these include the completion of God's heavenly temple or the first resurrection, an end to be made to the nations, leaving only the remnant of Israel under God's protection, accomplishing the fullness of the Gentiles and the conditional limits this imposes on Israel and the rest of the world. Israel to be brought to a position in which they can recognize their true Messiah, bringing in the everlasting kingdom where the body of Christ will rule and judge with Jesus for 1,000 years. We will look at more of this detail in upcoming videos. Coming back to the gleanings of the harvest or the outer court of the temple and how these relate to the evil servant. 
Pay close attention to what is written in Revelation 11 regarding the instructions given to John on how to measure the temple of God. Ask yourself why John was instructed to measure certain parts of the temple and why he had to leave out the outer court and how the time period that is mentioned in this passage is linked to the construction of God's temple. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angels stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. No doubt John is instructed to measure the temple, but specifically told not to measure the outer court. Why would he be given such an instruction? The only logical reason for this would be because the first two portions of the temple, that is the most holy place and the holy place, would at this point have reached completion, and that there would be nothing more to add to them, and that their dimensions are now fixed forever, so that John could measure them accurately. The outer court, in contrast, is said to be given 42 months, during which it will be trodden under foot of the Gentiles, and which John had to leave out. We already know that this portion of the temple is associated with the gleanings of God's harvest, and that they will be put to death by the poor and the stranger, as explained in part 2. This final part of God's temple will be assembled over a period of 42 months, from the time that it starts, or from the time at which the main harvest occurs, until the last two people, or the two witnesses, who will have the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, have laid down their lives willingly, and would have completed the task given to them, and would have nobody left to witness to. This will mark the completion of the fullness of the Gentiles, or God's harvest of faith. At this point, the three-part temple of God would have reached completion, and all three sections will be represented by people who would have been resurrected into glorified bodies, clothed in white, and who will be positioned on thrones with Jesus, ruling with him for 1,000 years. Keep the timing that is associated with the outer court in mind as we continue. In Matthew 5, just before Jesus mentions the fact that we are the light of the world, he links another aspect to the outer court that is associated with what he said to John in Revelation 11. Just as the foolish virgins without oil, those who are the salt of the earth and who have lost their savor, or who are not giving light to the world, will be cast out, having failed to fulfill their master's purpose for them. Considering this in context to the temple model, the salt that has lost its savor will no longer be capable of seasoning that which is being offered to the Lord. It is good for nothing and will be cast out into the outer court where it will be trampled underfoot. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of man. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. We find another model demonstrating this to us where Lot's wife turned into a monument for future generations to refer to of what happens to those whose desire is for the world they come from and not for the one they are heading towards. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So from the information that we have considered so far, we can see that the evil servant is a person who believes that Jesus is the Son of God and have received salvation as a result, someone whose desire is towards the world and how what the world offers can meet their needs instead of meeting the needs of their master. Although they have received talents or God's truth, they hide it from the world and like the foolish virgins, they lack oil for their lamps and are not spirit-filled lights that shine for the glory of our Heavenly Father in heaven. They do not have an intimate relationship with their master, given that the master uses their own words to condemn them, as well as their unfounded and unsubstantiated views of their master's character. They are afraid to use their talents in the world because they do not have a spirit of power, love and a sound mind. They fight and contend with their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. 
who are focused on the Master's desires instead of pursuing harmony and peace in the body of Christ. They fear the world's opinion instead of God's opinion of them. This is beginning to show us some of the attributes that are associated with the gleanings of the first resurrection harvest. But what does the word of God tell us about the good servant or the wise virgin? And what are some of their defining attributes? Two passages that define the good servant and highlight the primary attributes associated with them are found in Luke. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. This is further emphasized in Luke 21, where Jesus told his disciples that they should watch and pray in order to be found worthy to escape. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. The two primary attributes that define the good servant and which are clearly opposing the attributes of the evil servant are that the good servant is watching for the return of their master and is expecting his early return, and secondly, they pray continuously. What does this tell us about the good servant? Good servants are people whose expectation is to be with the master or bridegroom, and they have no desire for the world that we currently live in, or what it has to offer. They are not afraid to shine their light in the world and to follow the will of their master, even if it means that they will be ridiculed and persecuted for doing so. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. The fact that the good servant is continuously praying points to an intimate relationship with their master. There is continuous conversation and exchanges between this servant and the master, as one would expect in an intimate relationship between two people. These servants not only know who their master is, but they converse with him continuously and have experienced his love for them, understanding that he laid his life down for them. They have no fear of losing their position in the world, or how the world views them or persecutes them, but they act under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in power and in love with a sound mind. Does this world that is controlled by systems and rulers who are all under Satan's command really offer humanity anything to desire? Compared to what awaits us when our Lord returns for us, should we not look forward with great anticipation to what God has prepared for those that love Him, who awaits His early return? Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Given these promises, why would one choose to prefer a treasure in this world that is evil, where nothing is permanent and where this world is headed towards destruction? Should every believer in Christ not be focused on the little time that remains and what can be done to lay up more treasure in heaven that will be permanent? More attributes of the good servant are found in Matthew 5, where Jesus provides us with an explanation for those whom he calls the salt of the earth and the light to the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of man. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on an hill, cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This passage in Matthew 5 is connected to both the parable of the ten virgins, in which oil is required for giving light to the world, but at the same time it is also associated with the parable of the talents, where the talent, or the light, is hidden and not serving the purpose it was intended for. We also see many more of the attributes of the good servant described in this passage. God's word is really amazing when we see how various sections are connected and explained in other passages when we apply Isaiah 28 verse 9 to 10 in our approach to the word. So the attributes of the good servant are given as follows. They have an intimate relationship with their master. They expect and are watching for his early return. They are laying up treasures in heaven and not on earth. Their desire is for their master's will and not their own will. They are not hiding God's righteousness in their hearts, but are sharing it with the world under all circumstances, following their master's instructions as given in Mark 16 verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. They live a spirit-filled life, and are as a result meek, long-suffering, gentle, and patient towards those that they interact with, not looking for strife with others, and not smiting their fellow servants. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. They are merciful and forgiving towards others. They are pure in heart, and have no evil intent towards others. They are peacemakers and exhibit the attributes of love as explained in 1 Corinthians 13. They are persecuted for their master's sake. They are reviled and ridiculed by the world for sharing the truth with the world. In contrast, we see that these attributes lack in those who are called evil servants, or that they even exhibit opposites. We now have clearly defined attributes of the two remaining portions of God's harvest of faith, but we still need to consider the timing of the resurrection events that are associated with these and how the Word of God points these out to us. We will devote the next video to making sense of the timing involved with the remaining two resurrection events that form part of the first resurrection. I would like to address some comments and questions I've received for the remainder of this video, which will assist in providing some background that we will need to understand the timing of events in the next video. In order to do so, we have to remember that the current harvest concerns those who have faith in Jesus as being the Son of God. This is the main attribute of this harvest and is also represented by barley, which requires winnowing to separate the barley from the chaff. In a barley harvest, the harvested grain is thrown up into the air, allowing the wind or the Holy Spirit to remove the impurities or the sin. This is somewhat different to the wheat and grape harvests that we will also touch on as we continue, and it is very important to be able to distinguish between harvests and their attributes. I've had a comment on the previous video in which the person who commented pointed out the big problem with the views I have been presenting in the series, and how these would contradict the parable of the wheat and the tares. The comment was as follows. The wheat will remain until the end, after the tares are burnt up. If the tares are going to be gathered first, how can the wheat be raptured in advance? This is a clear example of assigning attributes of one harvest to another, or not distinguishing between the different harvests and when each of these will occur. We are currently positioned in the barley or faith harvest, and the wheat harvest has not started yet, and will only start when the barley harvest's field is completely empty. The rapture, therefore, has no impact on the wheat harvest, as it only applies to the barley harvest. We know that the barley harvest's main attributes are given as having faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, and include people from all nations. When this harvest reaches its end, what would be the condition on the earth at the time of its end, and when will this happen? 
Revelation 11 tells us that it will take 42 months for the outer court of God's temple to reach completion and for the gleanings of God's faith harvest to be reaped by the poor. And people who belong to this section of God's temple have to be put to death, according to God's word. What happens to those who are beheaded for refusing to deny their faith in Jesus, and what do they do after they have been killed? We read the following. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. These believers are beheaded for remaining faithful to the Lord, and gather under the altar of God, which is positioned in the outer court of the temple. This positioning is very important to note, as it matches the position of the gleanings of God's faith harvest, which is positioned in the outer court of His temple. They are given white robes and told to wait for a little season, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, until the number of their fellow servants, who would be killed as they were, have been accomplished. Do you see how this ties in perfectly with Revelation 11, when we understand the models of the harvest and the temple, where John is told not to measure the outer court until this number is achieved? But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Those under the altar of God are crying out with a loud voice for the Lord to avenge their blood on those that live on the earth. Those who would be living on the earth when the last person is beheaded for refusing to worship the beast would be those who follow after Satan or the Antichrist, and who have accepted his mark in their bodies, and those that remain of the nation of Israel, also known as the remnant of Israel. Look at what we read in Luke 18. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Can you see how this passage is directly connected to those who gather under the altar of God, who cry out to him with a loud voice to avenge their blood. What is further very insightful is what is said at the end of this passage. Will there be any faith left on the earth when Jesus returns? Why did Jesus add this bit of information to his explanation? If there is one person with faith in Jesus left on earth when Jesus returns to avenge those who were beheaded at his second coming, can one really conclude that the fullness of the Gentiles had been achieved, with that one person remaining and not being part of one of the two remaining resurrection events associated with those who had faith in Jesus. What definition that would help us to understand this better could one give to describe what Paul writes in Romans 11? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become n. Understanding the pattern of the harvest and the temple and the attributes that are associated with God's faith harvest, does this passage by Paul not show us that the fullness of the Gentiles is linked to the completion of the three-part faith harvest and the completion of the three-part temple of God, otherwise known as the completion of the first resurrection? If there is one person that remains on earth who has faith in Jesus and who have not been beheaded for their faith, can one conclude that the fullness of the Gentiles have been achieved in light of the information provided in these four passages? Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord." None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become n. 
And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? If our aim is to arrive at an understanding that would not contradict the word of God, then the only conclusion that we can draw from the information provided in these passages is that there would be no person eligible for salvation through faith remaining on the earth when the Lord returns at his second coming. Those who would be living on the earth at this point in time would be the remnant of Israel who would have their blindness removed and those who have the mark of the beast who have been given the ability to buy and sell in the place of their life. Have a look at what the word of God tells us about Israel in this regard. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. This passage introduces us to the primary attribute of the wheat harvest, and this is the fact that the harvest has no faith whatsoever, and that it concerns only the nation of Israel. Israel, like Thomas, will have to be shown who their Messiah is, and will only believe it when they have endured affliction and have recognized their offense. I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. This passage tells us that Israel will be required to go through a time of affliction, or otherwise known as Jacob's trouble, that will bring them to a point where they will be able to acknowledge their offense, which is the rejection of their true Messiah. And when they reach this point, also coinciding with the fullness of the Gentiles, they will be allowed to look upon their Messiah for a second time, and realize who he is at his second coming. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This would be the point at which Israel would enter their protection in the wilderness, because the word shows us that the resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses and the remnant's flight into the wilderness will coincide with the fullness of the Gentiles being achieved, Israel's blindness being removed, the return of Jesus in his second coming with his bride, and the largest earthquake the world will ever see all occurring in the same time frame, as shown in the following passages that all point to the same event. I will only list some of these passages in the interest of time. You are welcome to read these on your own, keeping these aspects in mind. I will cover more of this in upcoming videos. The Word of God continues to describe the first fruits of the wheat harvest to us in the following passage, confirming the fact that only the nation of Israel will be part of this harvest. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Revelation 7 describes the 144,000 to us who are called the first fruits of a harvest, and those who belong to this group are exclusively from the nation of Israel, and the Word of God meticulously shows us that there will be 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, who is a nation in which there is no faith. The tares are then associated with the three-part wheat harvest that represents Israel during the millennial reign of Christ with his bride. We will look at how the tares are sown into the wheat harvest in an upcoming video. In the next video we will look in more detail at identifying the resurrection events that are associated with the remaining two parts of the first resurrection, and the timing of events that we need to consider in order to avoid contradicting certain passages in the Word of God. If you have found this video to be helpful in providing understanding of what is written to us in the Word of God, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel so you can follow upcoming videos when they are uploaded. Also please help me by sharing this with others so that more can receive understanding of God's Word. May God bless you and keep you and may His grace accompany you wherever you go. Until next time.
God bless.